everyone. My name is Bing Han. I'm a practicing dermatopathologist at a private practice lab um, at Atlanta, Georgia. I was a LSU graduate. Uh, my training uh, was between 2017 and 2021. After that, I had a year of uh, dermatopathology fellowship training at Tulane. Um, I think some of you, uh, at least Wen Jing and uh, Zid and uh, Mariam, uh, you guys know me other than you three. The other people may not know me, but uh, um, it is such an honor to be invited to give the dermatopathology lecture to all of you. I am sorry that uh, I can only use this recording way to teach. I wish I could uh, uh, be more interactive with the Zoom technique. However, as a private practice uh, place, teaching is never a uh, prioritized work. So uh, I, this is the only way I can uh, provide my teaching. Um, I hope it can be still uh, helpful. This is a picture taken uh, back in 2017. I was a first year resident at that time. You may know Dr. Stephanie Moss, uh, Moss at uh, Children's Hospital and Dr. Catherine Wong at VA Hospital. But everyone in this picture, uh, we are practicing and uh, it was such a pleasure and honor to work at LSU. I really missed everyone. Uh, a few days ago, Dr. Bala came to the Atlanta. We met, uh, Dr. Bala said uh, she invited me to give lectures about the derm pass. I know we have very talented dermatopathologists uh, such as Dr. Martin and Dr. Lola, but from my perspective, I think since I just finish, finished my training including fellowship uh, and took my APCP and derm pass boards, I think I have some more um, different experience to teach you guys. So I'm pleased, uh, I'm honored, and I'm very glad I accepted this uh, invitation. At first, I would like to talk a little bit about the pathology subspecialty. This is the subspecialty listed on the American Board of Pathology website. And you can see there are many subspecialty. Among those, a few of them, uh, they are not only accepting the, the pathology residents, but also they accept the people from other specialty, such as the transfusion medicine and uh, the clinical informatics. They accept the people from clinic. The molecular genetic pathology, they also accept the people from pediatric. And derm pass is one of the subspecialty also accept other subspecialty resident. Um, they accept the people from dermatology as well. That also implies the clinical and the pathological correlation is very important in those subspecialties. What is dermatopathology? In general, the dermatopathology is the pathology uh, of the skin and uh, as well as the hair and the nails. We have a very strong relationship between us and the dermatologist. Since there are many dis disorders without the appropriate clinical context, we cannot make, make the diagnosis. And also, there are so many skin disorders, they rely on us to make the right the diagnosis. Every day, I make lots of phone calls um, and discussion with the clients, which we call our provider, to have a better understanding of the disorder and generate the most accurate diagnosis to the patient. This is the general classification scheme for dermatologic disorder. They draw this one as a tree. If we follow from the root, all the dermatologic disorders can be subdivided into the inflammatory and the neoplastic. Those are the two main branches. Under the inflammatory, we have um, non-infectious infectious, such as fungal, bacterial, viral, and papillosquamous and eczematous dermatosis. This is the inflammatory aspect. Then under the neoplastic, we have the malignant and the benign tumors. 
in terms of the types of biopsy the provider either he or she is a dermatologist or is a general practitioner she or she can perform the biopsy in their clinic or in the OR room overall there are four types of biopsy techniques including the A which is a superficial shave biopsy usually that is the way for superficial neoplas neoplasm such as basal cell carcinoma and B the technique is for some deeper lesion such as the tumor is located in the deep dermis and for C this is uh, what we call punch biopsy the punch biopsy can perform a straight from epidermis dermis all the way to a little bit of subcutaneous fat if necessary they can do double punch to include more of the subcutaneous fat that is very important to diagnose a paniculitis and for A and B um, the A technique superficial shave they do not have to put suture for the B and C they need to put suture and for D this is a wedge excisional biopsy usually that can sample more tissue and of course this will need to uh, put a suture on for pathology residents I would recommend two books for you to read um, the first book is written by Dr. Dirk Elston the Dermatopathology 3rd edition this book has um, tons of great pictures and the explanation are very easy to understand and easy to read overall second book is the practical dermatopathology it has a third edition but compared to it to the second edition there is not much changed this book was written by dr uh, ronald uh, rapini and um, people consider this as a very classic textbook as a beginner i would not recommend to read this book as a learning learning uh, book um, but as a pra practicing dermatopathologist this is a must-have um, you can use this one as a reference book but if you want to systemically read the dermatopathology I would recommend the Dr. Dr. Austin's book start from there in terms of how many lectures I should give to cover the most high yield topics I think I can give uh, five lectures as shown here uh, in the first one I will which is today's lecture I will talk about the introduction benign neoplasm the second we will be malignant epithelial neoplasm plus soft tissue and melanocytics the third one will cover cyst infection paniculitis the third uh, the fourth one will be inflammatory dermatosis vasculitis and connective tissue disease last one will be congenital disorder and the bullous disorder which is very high yield in the board exam which may also beneficial for our um, fourth year residents and you can see I will use only two lectures to cover the neoplasm and three to cover the non neoplastic this cartoon is to demonstrate the skin architecture and you can see the epidermis has some hair and it can be subdivided into four different layers we will talk about that in the inflammatory part not only the epidermis but the dermis contain many structure including all the connective tissue the blood vessel to support the nutrition the hair follicle unit including the hair follicle the spacious gland and the sweat duct um, then is the subcutaneous fat all the structures everything can go wrong so that's why the derm pass is a very complicated uh, subject and for new epithelial neoplasms I will basically subdivide them into four big categories including keratinocytic or epidermal proliferation mainly is the squamous disorder the second one is the proliferation derived from spacious unit spacious ducts then the third is the sweat duct um, proliferation the last one is the hair follicle proliferation each of the 
big category can further subdivide into benign and malignant. For the benign part, such as carotenocytic epidermal proliferation, uh, SEPK is one of the benign disorder. In contrast, actinic keratosis and squamous cell carcinoma are considered to be malignant. Technically, AK is a pre-malignancy, but I put them together since they will be better understandable. And we have specioma, in contrast, spacious carcinoma, etc. So this is the neoplasms can be subdivided into benign and malignant. The first disorder is the separate keratosis. I know in at uh, during your routine uh, AP and surgical rotation, you have seen this a lot. Uh, here is a clinical picture of the separate keratosis. You can see this um, hyperpigmented uh, papule uh, on top of the skin, and it is uh, has a sharp demarcation. We call that a stuck on oily uh, papule, and people usually will do a shave biopsy to remove it. Uh, at the shave biopsy, you can see uh, it has a very flat uh, base. Even uh, people sometimes describe this one as a string sign, means when you put a string, everything should be above the string. And the feature is uh, pseudocyst, or people call a uh, horn cyst. Why pseudo? is because the cyst, they have opening to the surface. So technically, it's not an enclosed space we call a uh, pseudocyst here. Uh, one uh, another feature is the keratin is a loose keratin. Uh, in comparison, the actinic keratosis, which will be talked about in the next lecture, the malignant neoplasms, should have more uh, dense and uh, perikeratotic keratin. This one is more loose keratin, means it's healthy, and this is benign. So uh, very often. And we seen we have seen many uh, separate keratosis. Um, here I just listed uh, three common um, subtypes of the separate keratosis. In case you see some of them and you you don't have a clue if they are SK or not. The first one you can see um, they have some pigmented reticulated uh, really ridges and they are interconnected. So. This type we call this uh, reticulated. Um, if you wonder, well, this thing can look like a solar lentigo. Some people call uh, solar lentigo um, like funny names as uh, dirty socks or dirty puppy feet. Um, well, it's uh, not not uh, uncommon to see uh, the reticulated SK adjacent uh, to uh, solar lentigo, and some people believe. A lot of um, solar lenticles, they can have transition into this reticulated or macular uh, separate keratosis. So this is reticulated. And the second picture, instead of this, um, the first picture we saw is a thickened acanthotic uh, separate keratosis. This one has a much um, hyperkeratotic, lots of keratin, and the surface is also. Um, irregular and papillomatosis. So this one uh, is the subtype of hyperkeratotic separate keratosis. The third one um, is the, uh, if you zoom in, you can see there are lots of uh, round um, structures. You may wonder, are they uh, cutaneous uh, pearl, uh, keratin pearls? which is a feature of a squamous cell carcinoma, but actually they are not. Um, you can see the bottom still is flat. So from a low power view, we know this is still SK. And why SK has so many squamous eddies or squamous um, uh, forming those uh, squamous horn uh, round structures, that is uh, the SK has been uh, irritated. This, uh, we call this irritated SK. This is a very common uh, tissue we receive. Do not confuse this one with the squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, the next disorder is the clear cell acanthoma. The clear cell acanthoma usually um, present as a single lesion 
you can see this one on the skin and it's very sharp demarcated uh, from the surroundings and normal skin and if you biopsy this one and look at this tissue you can see it's a uh, well circumscribed symmetrical the base is still flat but compare uh, this one with uh, SK we just saw we don't see the um, uh, pseudocyst instead the cells they are very pale that's a, a very important feature and when we look at the edge of the neoplasm such as here and here and here is the zoom in the area from a different picture you can see the neoplasm has a very sharp demarcation between the normal skin and to the neoplasm so those are the features of this disease we have a very pale or clear cell uh, keratinocytes with a very sharp demarcation as implied here and we have neutrophils and perikeratosis which can be seen in psoriasis uh, in fact some people believe the clear cell ecanzoma is not a neoplasm uh, instead it's just a psoriasis in the local um, a localized psoriasis um, but uh, at this moment I hope you can uh, still uh, remember the features have the psoriasis feature but uh, it's a um, single lesion and now uh, we move on to those um, uh, epithelial neoplasms derived from skin adnexa. Uh, first, let's talk about the uh, spacious gland because the spacious gland or spacious neoplasms um, are the most um, easy to understand uh, among all those uh, skin adnexa neoplasms. The first one uh, you can see this is a demonstration demonstrating there is a hair follicle uh, including the hair root the hair sheath and uh, the hair shaft and at the periphery you can see two uh, spacious glands on the left and right and there is the erector muscle here and here is the uh, H&E picture we are uh, very familiar with you can see the spacious gland those are the sepocytes spacious gland they have the uh, duct opening into the hair follicle so that is the normal structure and when we zoom in look at the uh, sepocytes they have um, not many blue uh, immature uh, sepocytes at the periphery there are some so those are the um, immature cells but overall uh, they are mature the sepocytes with uh, relatively small nuclei and some uh, lobules inside of the bubbly uh, cytoplasm this is the normal spacious gland remember they should open not to the surface but to the hair follicle the first uh, disorder in this uh, category is the nevus spacious nevus um, does not mean this is a melanocytic neoplasm the nevus here implies this is a hamartoma and as a hamartoma this nevus species usually present at birth and it has four uh, four features as a broad bald bumpy and bubbly so this is the clinical picture you can see um, from the person's scalp and in the scalp area which should have lots of hairs but this area is uh, hairless that is because the uh, hematoma replaced um, the hair normal hair follicle causing this broad lesion and causing the baldness the surface look bumpy and when you cut the tissue examine it at the micro under the microscope you see those uh, spacious duct and the glands so that is called bubbly this uh, nevus spacious um, usually they can make the diagnosis uh, easily they biopsy or make an excision is because it can have some association with other neoplasms the neoplasms we use the abbreviation BTS also for mnemonic if you like the K-pop uh, if you don't know K-pop that's fine <laughs> you just remember uh, the BTS stand for basal cell carcinoma trichoblastoma 
and SPAP. I will talk about the SPAP in the later um, uh, lecture, in the le in later slides. So uh, this is the uh, histology of the Nevis species. The surface is uh, bumpy, and we have a loss of normal hair follicle compared with the normal scalp and many uh, spacious ducts. So this is the Nevis species. The next one, uh, I think uh, we have this biopsy quite often. Usually it's an um, older individual and they biopsy from the person's uh, face. They say rule out basal cell carcinoma. And uh, from the histology, we see there are just a mature uh, spacious ducts and the spacious glands. But this one has a very unique feature um, make it not a regular, normal, uh, spacious duct. The feature is, you can see, here is the opening. The opening of the spacious duct, they open directly uh, on the onto the skin surface. So this is an abnormal feature. Uh, as we mentioned uh, in the histology uh, section, we say this opening should be uh, opened at the surface of inside of the hair follicle but this one they open directly to the skin however the spacious gland they are still mature we don't see those uh, blue cells so uh, when we have that combination we have mature spacious gland with the opening at dilated follicular opening uh, with uh, no abnormal germinative basal layer we call this spacious hyperplasia this is a uh, um, normal aging precise and quite often people biopsy to rule out basal cell carcinoma uh, in contrast those uh, two disorders they are different um, i put them together spacious adenoma slash spacious uh, cbcioma it's because those two disorders we consider them um, at the same spectrum um, both of them are composed of um, blue nodules with the red ducts. You can see those are the blue nodules with the red duct, and they have um, directly open, directly open to the skin surface. Uh, the difference is uh, when we have less than fifty percent of the uh, blue cells compared um, to those uh, normal uh, sebocytes. Uh, we call this uh, spacious adenoma. And if we have the blue cells, more than 50% of the entire neoplasm, we call it specioma. This 50% thing is uh, totally arbitrary, and some pathologists believe this is the uh, same disease. So um, a lot of people just lump them together, call spacious adenoma, but for the uh, exam purpose, or our usual practice, you can still use this 50% as a cutoff. But uh, they are the same thing. Um, in the same spectrum, they have same treatment. So it's not uh, really necessary uh, to struggle is that 49% versus 51%. Uh, both are benign and it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but what know that when we have uh, the spacious neoplasms such as the spatioma or spacious adenoma, um, especially when the spacious neoplasm happens on a younger person. By saying that, I mean more than 50 years of age, or they are present extra facial area, or they are multiple. We should think the possibility of the muratory syndrome. Uh, to test the muratory syndrome, uh, we do those uh, four tests. I know we have this uh, test available at LSU as well, including MLH1, PMS2, P PS MSH2, and MSH6. Um, they are a form of Lynch syndrome, can uh, not only associated with the spacious neoplasms, but also they have association with the keratoid and doma, which will be talked about later. As the picture implies, uh, this neoplasm is has a loss of MLH1 and PMSH2. Just to remember, loss of th those two neopla uh, two um, mismatch repair genes does not mean this is a muratory syndrome. It only it can be seen in uh, sporadic sporadic disorder. Uh, in order to make the diagnosis, 
people usually need to do the germline test, um, especially when we have only the MLH1 and the PMS2. PMS2, those are more uh, associated with the sporadic rather than the germline mutation. In general, the spacious neoplasms are easy to understand, but when we move on to the sweat duct tumor and the follicular tumor, they are kind of more difficult to understand. Not only the names are confusing, but also the morphology. You may think everything looks like a basal cell carcinoma, but when you pay attention to the details, you may find something called buzzword can lead you to the correct diagnosis. For example, in the poroma category, the buzzword for me is the poroid cells. When you see this type of cytology, you know you are under the diagnosis of poroma. Similarly, if you see many components in the sweat duct tumor, you should think hydroadenoma. If you see the tadpole shape glandular structure, you should think syringoma. If you see big blue balls, you should think spheroadenoma. If you see the jigsaw puzzle, you should, you should think syringoma. If you see something look like the salivary duct, salivary gland pleomorphic adenoma, you should think the cutaneous mixed tumor. If you see something papillary in the skin, you should think the HPAP or the SPAP. Poroma. Um, poroma, when we, uh, the buzzword is the poroid cells. What is the poroid cell? Uh, the poroid cell is just a, a small uh, cuboidal cell. We know the squamous epithelium, those keratinocytes, they are cuboidal. But the poroid cells, they are the cells derived from the uh, sweat duct, so their size is smaller and um, they don't have the uh, maturation from the uh, basal layer all the way to the granular layer. So it looks like a more cute, smaller version of the keratinocyte. And you can see this is the epidermis and this is the poroid part. I also included a high power picture. You can see the poroid cells, they have uh, uh, almost a uniform looking. Also, you can see there is um, uh, a sweat duct and the sweat duct has a pink cuticle uh, encircling this duct. So this is the feature of the poroma. And in the poroma uh, category, you know those stomatopathologists, they are uh, splitting hairs. And here they are splitting the sweat duct tumors. tumors. Um, people can subdivide them into the classic uh, poroma, which uh, I believe if the AP and CP test you, it will be the classic poroma. Uh, it has another name called uh, um, Ecrine poroma, but uh, um, this may be the most common one. It involves both a dermal and a epidermal. So we divide the poroma subtypes based on the uh, location of the tumor. If they are both in the in the both dermal and the epidermal, we call classic poroma. If the tumor only involves the epidermal uh, component, we call this hydroacanthoma simplex. And if the um, poroid cells or poroid neoplasm only exist in the dermis, we call this dermal duct tumor. So the subtypes, I, I, I don't think they, uh, in terms of the treatment, they make too much of a difference since it's a benign tumor and um, the margin doesn't matter, the treatment it doesn't matter. So people just um, uh, to uh, separate them, maybe because of uh, the curiosity, I guess. So classic poroma, some people also call this eicrine poroma, is a circumscribed endophytic proliferation, usually located at uh, people's uh, sole or palm, present as a um, erythematic um, nodule. And histologically, you can see the tumor um, present not only at the epidermis, but also they have a growth pattern involved the dermis as well. So that is a classic pattern of the poroma. When the poroid cells involves only the epidermis, as the picture shown here, 
you can still see there is a thin layer of basal layer of the epidermis and all the polo poroid cells are located above the basal layer that means all the poroid neoplasms neoplastic cells are located in the epidermis and by definition this we call hydroacanthoma simplex if the poroid cells are forming big nodules located only in the dermis or has very minimal connection to the epidermis, the diagnosis will change to dermoduct tumor. However, to separate the dermoduct tumor versus a hydroacanthoma simplex versus the classic poroma is more of an academic question since the, uh, clinically the treatment are the same and it's not really necessary to make a very uh, distinct differentiation if you have the feature across uh, two of those tumors. After talking uh, about the poroid neoplasm, let's uh, start with the more complicated hydroadenoma. Do not confuse this one hydroadenoma with the one we just mentioned before, the hydroacanthoma simplex. Um, all the skin neoplasms, they have uh, very uh, weird names and sometimes uh, sound similar, but try not to confuse with them. So this one is a hydroadenoma. It usually presents as a solitary nodule inside of the dermis. The architecture is more complex. Instead of single cells, usually they have not only uh, one but the three types of cell including the squamoid, poroid and clear, uh, clear cell not only the cells look more complex but also they can form the ducts cysts and lots of sclerosis as the picture showing here here is the sclerosis here is the cells and sometimes you can see uh, at the periphery there are uh, cystic degeneration and based on the different types of combination, we have uh, subtypes as well. We have clear cell hydroadenoma, which mainly composed of uh, clear cell. And if, if we have lots of solid area as well as cystic area, we call solid cystic hydroadenoma. This is the clear cell hydroadenoma. From the picture on the left, you can see it has dermal nodules composed of the clear cells. Be very careful because if you don't know this category exists, you may call this one a metastatic renal cell carcinoma because of the clearing of the cells. I have also seen some uh, pathologist which is not dermpath trained call this one a inv invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So if you are not familiar with some different, some diagnosis, uh, don't be shy, try to look for help. There can be some cystic degeneration as well. The next uh, category is the nodular and the cystic hydroadenoma. As the name implies, you can see the tumor is a dermal based tumor composed of solid areas and cystic degeneration. And from the high power magnet, high power picture on the right, you can see the three types of cell we mentioned, including the poroid cells. Um, not many clear cells here, but we have the squamous cells and the cystic degeneration. Next the disorder is syringoma. Syringoma is more common in Asian population. It usually presents as multiple small papules, as the picture implies, located usually on the lower eyelid or the upper cheek. The preorbital region is more common. If we shave one of the lesion, you will see this tadpole-shaped uh, cysts. Sometimes people also use the term uh, parsley tie-shaped cysts. This is quite common and a lot of our dermatology providers, they know this disorder, so they don't necessarily biopsy if they are multiple and more classic. But when they biopsy this lesion, we need, as a pathologist, we need to know this um, 
pet pole or pet lead type pattern can have multiple other differential diagnoses we need to know, including sclerosing basal cell carcinoma, desmoplastic trichoepithelioma, uh, MAC. Those will be talked about when I uh, finish my second lecture regarding um, malignant uh, epithelial neoplasms. At this point, just remember this tightly uh, pathy tie or tadpole morphology with this multiple small papules, they are syringoma. Next disorder is the spiroadenoma. It is considered as one of the painful dermal tumors. When we talk about the buzzword, for me, the buzzword is big blue balls in the dermis. As the low power picture, you can see there is a big ball inside the dermis. But when we go to the high magnification, there are more details, including the tumor is forming some ducts, and we can see the biphasic cells. The cells at the periphery, they look more dark. The cells at the inside, they look more pale, and the cytology is a little larger than the peripheral cells. Also, we can see scattered lymphocytes here and there, and we can see the basement membrane zone material within the tumor. Those are the features of, of, of a spiroadenoma. And the next disorder is the cylindroma. Cylindroma is one of my favorite tumors. It usually present as solitary nodule, and it we can consider this cylindroma existing on a spectrum with the spiroadenoma. And in fact, I was trying to collect, collect a neoplasm that has only cylindroma without any component of the spiroadenoma. I found it quite challenging. As this case, you can see it has the cylindroma area, but also if you just circle this area, you may argue there is a spiroadenoma mixed within this cylindroma. So that implies the spiroadenoma and the cylindroma, they, a lot of times they mixed together. And the tumor cell also uh, has the biphasic cells. As we mentioned in the spiroadenoma, the peripheral cells are more hypochromatic and the cells inside them are less hypochromatic. We also see this uh, basement membrane zone material encircling uh, the tumor islands forming this jigsaw puzzle. I like this uh, morphology very much. And we can see there are ducts here and there. This is the cylindroma. Since we mentioned uh, the painful tumors, here is a summary. People used the pneumonic as London egg as painful tumors pneumonic, leomyoma, eccrine spiroadenoma, neuroma, dermatofibroma, angiolipoma, neurolymoma. Actually, the neurolymoma has another name, is schwannoma, but neurolymoma fits the London egg pneumonic better. Endometrioma, glomus tumor, and the granular cell tumor. Those are the painful tumors. Next, uh, I would like to spend a little time to talk about the Brooks-Bigler syndrome. The syndrome is associated with the mutation in the CYLD gene. As we mentioned before, this can be seen in the cylindroma and the spiroadenoma. Not only those two sweat duct tumors, but uh, it can be also associated with the trichoepithelioma and the trichoblastomas as well. Also, there can be basal cell carcinoma or the benign cylindroma spiroadenoma can have malignant degeneration. As the picture implied, this uh, patient uh, has many um, tumors on the face, and this is a brooks bigler syndrome patient. Next disorder is the mixed tumor, usually presents as a solid, solitary uh, dermal nodule, and uh, common location is the skin and neck, uh, and neck region. This tumor has uh, two components, including the epithelial component and the stromal component. The epithelial component usually is the eccrine duct proliferation. The stromal component usually is the myxoid or chondroid. And when we have that combination in the salivary gland, we call that pleomorphic adenoma, right? But on the skin, we call this uh, 
uh, cutaneous uh, cutaneous mixed tumor or cutaneous myxoid uh, sorry cutaneous chondroid uh, syringoma they are the same thing um, but unlike the uh, pleomorphic adenoma in the sweat in the cerebral gland they can become a carcinoma EXPA the cutaneous uh, mixed tumor usually when they happen on the face they do not do the malignant degeneration um, but there can be a malignant mixed tumor that usually is de novo next the keyword is the papillary things which is the HPAP and SPAP I use the HPAP and SPAP because the full name is hard to read is a hydroadenoma papilliferum and a syringocystadenoma papilliferum. Both of the lesions, they are cystic plus papillary architecture. They can look uh, very alike from the low magnification, the papillary structure, but they are different. Try to remember them, I use the 2H and 2S. The 2H for the hydroadenoma papilliferum is there is from the hidden area which means the vulva and the perianal area. And the second edge is also hidden, but it's hidden inside of the dermis. It does not have the epidermal connection. The SPAP, in contrast, the first S is from the scalp, that is the most common location. The second S is surface. It usually has the epidermal connection. And uh, the uh, SPAP, has association with the nevus uh, spacious very often and also it usually contains the plasma cells here is the picture on the left you can see there is a tumor and it has opening to the skin it is a papillary structure and within the papillae there are uh, plasma cells so what is the diagnosis I hope you call this one is a uh, SPAP and on the right it does not have a connection to the epidermis. It is inside the inside of the dermis, and there are some apocrine metaplasia. So what is this? I hope you said this is um, uh, HPAP. Then that is correct. Moving on to the follicular tumors. In order to have a better understanding of the follicular tumors, you need to know the different structure of uh, hair follicular uh, structure. As the demonstration here, the hair follicle can be divided into infundibulum, isthmus, and the inferior segment. How can we separa separate them apart? The two landmarks is the connection of the erector pili muscle, which is located here. The other one is the opening of the spacious gland. The spacious gland, as we mentioned, they should have opening directly to the hair follicle. So everything above the spacious gland we call infundibulum. Everything in between the opening of spacious gland and the connecting point of the erector muscle we call isthmus. Everything up below we call inferior segment. And furthermore, the inferior segment we can subdivide um, into bulb and matrix. The difference of the bulb is the uh, bulb, by definition, it is the bulbous expansion enclosing the entire higher papillae. But the matrix only implies to those germin germinative cells. So bulb include the higher papillae and the matrix only include those matrical cells. That's the difference. And let's move on to this uh, normal H and E structure. I would like to uh, point uh, point to three structure. First one is the hair papilla, which is this location. You can see it has the spindle stromal cells as well as those um, vascular uh, structure. That is the hair papilla. When the tumor derived from this location, you will see those uh, spindle cells, which we call uh, papillary mesenchymal body. And this area, which has a very high NC ratio and blue cells, we, we call them matrical cells in the hair bulb. And furthermore, this layer we call outer root sheath. You can see the cells are more pink and pale than when the tumor is derived from this outer root sheath, 
we know it will have this morphology of clear and pale cells. <clears throat> Once we understand better about the structure, we will have a better understanding of the different disorder. If the tumor is derived from the follicular germinative, which is from the area close to the hair papillae, then we have the diagnosis or the tumor of a trichoblastoma or the trichoepithelioma. Those two, I consider them as uh, siblings. We will talk about that later. If the tumor is derived from the follicular matricle cells, then the diagnosis will be the pilometricoma. If the tumor is derived from the root sheath, we call that a tricholamoma. If the tumor is derived from the isthmus, which is from the upper uh, in the middle portion, we call that tumor of follicular infundibulum. Please pay attention to the name. Even it has the infundibulum in the diagnosis, but technically it is derived from the isthmus. So this is a misnomer. And if the tumor has the panfollicular differentiation, then the diagnosis will be the trichofolliculoma because it has um, all the components from follicles. Then if it is a hamartoma, then it will be fibrofolliculoma. The names are very confusing, but in general, there are only uh, three uh, starting uh, terms, including trico, pilo, and uh, fibro. And uh, when we talk about the follicular tumors, the buzzword for me is very important as well. When we have the trichol, uh, when we have the papillary mesenchymal bodies, or those very spindle stromal cells, we consider this to be uh, either trichoblastoma or trichoepithelioma. If we have many ghost cells, and since this is a common, I guess you can make the diagnosis of pilometricoma uh, very easily. And if it has a warty surface on the top, plus the pale cell, which resemble the outer root sheath of the hair follicle, we know that will be a tricholimoma. And if we have a plate-like structure and connected to the epidermis, the diagnosis will be tumor of follicular infundibulum. If we have the morphology, looks like big follicle and small follicle, which use the funny terms as hand and cheeks, we know the diagnosis should be trichofolliculoma. If we have follicle with the radiating strength going outwards, we know it should be a fibrofolliculoma. Those are the buzzwords. To me, they are very uh, useful to make the diagnosis. You don't have to remember everything, but the buzzword will lead you to the right diagnosis. The first uh, tumor or tumors under the follicular category is the trichoblastoma or the trichoepithelioma. I consider those uh, two disorders are siblings because they are in the same spectrum. The difference is that the trichoblastoma usually is deeper seated and the tumor nodules are larger. In contrast, the trichoepithelioma usually are located more superficially and the tumor nests are smaller. But there can be lots of uh, overlap and you do not have to make the clear distinction if the neoplasm has um, borderline uh, in both two, in both lesions. The key features, or I mentioned the buzzword, is the papillary mesenchymal bodies, or PMB. What is PMB? Remember in the normal hair structure, we mentioned in the hair papillae, there, there are blood vessels, there are more spindle uh, stromas, as implied here, if you pay attention, if you pay attention to this location, you will see in outside of this uh, basaloid structure, there are some streaming spindle cells uh, enclosing this structure. So this resembles the hair papillae. That's the stru structure we call papillary mesenchymal bodies. This is a very useful um, clue to make the diagnosis of the trichoblast or trichoap. Also, we can see the cellular stroma, which is different from the basal cell carcinoma. The basal cell carcinoma is a big uh, differentiation, uh, differential diagnosis. But uh, the basal cells, if you look at the stroma, if you remember the stroma, 
the retraction artifact is more obvious and the stroma is more loose mixoid and this one is more cellular. In the uh, trichoplast and the trichoap, app, uh, the gene associated uh, in the familial TE or TB is the CYLD gene and if the patient has a germline CYLD gene mutation uh, there will be a syndrome called the Brock Spiegler syndrome associated with that. I will have a slide to talk about that later. Trust this is the trichoblastoma. The trichoblastoma, which I mentioned, it should be deeper and larger, but still the stroma is the same. We can see those cellular stroma, and sometimes we can see the papillary mesenchymal bodies. Pilometricoma, we see this quite often. We should have two components, including the ghost cells and the basaloid cells. The ratio can vary. Sometimes you see the entire tumor is almost everything is ghost cell that we can still call palometricoma. But the more challenging part is when we have a palometricoma that is completely uh, basaloid cells without any ghost cell. At that moment, you need to cut a lot of dippers. When you see one ghost cell, then you know you are dealing with the palometricoma. The differential diagnosis, including the um, proliferating pilar cyst. The pilar cyst, we see that very often as well. If there are some proliferation in the cyst wall, we call proliferating. Those can have the very dense keratin, but they are not ghost cell. And the palometrical carcinoma means the palometricoma with more infiltrative growth pattern we call palometrical carcinoma. And this um, palometricoma is caused by the CTNNB1 gene, which is the encoding the beta catenin gene as well. Multiple palometricoma may associate with a gardener syndrome. Trachylimoma. Trachylimoma usually is a warty nodule located in the, uh, on the face, usually is near either the mouth or near the nose. And clinically, uh, the surface is usually warty. Then in terms of the histology, and you can see the warty surface means the papillary uh, surface correlate with the clinical impression of a wart. And we, if you remember, the structure of the outer root sheath and the cytology of the outer root sheath, they are more clear. So if you look at the high power picture, you can appreciate the clearing of the cytology. So clear cell and warty surface, those are the two main uh, characters for this disorder. And the third one, usually people will mention, is it should have the eosinophilic basement membrane zone also aka the BMZ, which you can appreciate here. But not always you can see this type of uh, BMZ, uh, so the importance is not as the warty and uh, clear cell cytology. If the person has multiple trichelimoma, we should think about the Cowden syndrome and how to remember the Cowden and the trichelimoma. People say cow, how what does cow say? They say mu, so tricholimoma. So that's how people remember. The Cowden syndrome usually presents as multiple trichelimomas. Here on the face has multiple trichelimoma. It is a mutation in the P10 gene which can cause multiple hematomas, not only on the skin but also the versatile hematoma, including GI polyps, breast, and the thyroid cancer as well. So tumor of the follicular infundibulum, usually it is a subepidermal tumor forming this plate-like architecture with the reticulated cores and nests and the cells, they are pale eosinophilic cytoplasm. From my experience, this uh, TFI or tumor of follicular infundibular is usually not a first biopsy specimen, usually it's an incidental finding and trichofolliculoma, as we mentioned, the buzzword is the hen and the chicks. You can see there is a big dilated follicle with many hairs inside, and at the periphery there are some small uh, follicles. The follicles, they also have germinal centers, so they are, they are normal villous hair. So this is a feature of trichofolliculoma. Fibrofolliculoma. 
This is a hamartoma. Usually we see there is a central follicle with thin threads with less than four cells across. So there is no hair when we compare this febrile folliculoma to the trichofolliculoma. No hair is a feature and it is associated with FLCN gene. And let's talk about the FLCN gene. When we have that germline mutation, we call that bert hoch dubay syndrome. It is not only associated with skin tumor, but also associated with renal cell carcinoma, pneumothorax, uh, pulmonary cyst, and thyroid carcinoma. So here is a summary of the uh, syndromes we talked about today, including the muratory syndrome, which has uh, spacious tumors and the keratoacanthoma. Cowden disease, which has trichelamoma, bird hawk du bay, has the febrile folliculoma and the renal cell carcinoma. Um, the garden syndrome has the palometricoma and some febroma. The Brooks spicular syndrome has multiple trichal epithelioma, spiroadenoma, and the syndroma. In general, for the AP and CP board uh, test purposes, all the skin related inherited disorder, they are all. Uh, autosomal dominant. So don't worry about uh, the AR and XR. I don't think they will be uh, tested. And here is a quick recap of the um, uh, things we teach today. When we have a horn cyst, we, we are talking about the separate keratosis. When we say have the clear cells that is also inflamed with sharp demarcation, that is a clear cell acanthoma. If we have broad, bald, bumpy, and bubbly, that is a nevus species. When we have mature adipocytes with opening to the surface of skin, we call species hyperplasia. If we have blue cells less than 50%, that is species adenoma. If we have blue cells more than 50%, it's specioma. Poroid cells, poroma. Many components, hydradenoma. Tadpole cells, syringoma. Blue balls, spiroidenoma, jigsaw puzzle, cylindroma. Mixed tumor is the pleomorphic adenoma of the salivary gland, but it's in the skin. HPAP and SPAP is the papillary thing, but H is in the hidden area. S is on the scalp. Trichoblastoma and trichoepithelioma is which has papillary mesenchymal bodies. Palometricoma is the cell uh, is the ghost cell disorder uh, tumor trichelamoma is the warty surface with pale cell tumor of follicular infundibulum is the plate-like reticulated pale cell trichofolliculoma is the hen and the chicken some people call um, baby and mama uh, follicles fibrofolliculoma is the follicle with a thin strand radiation so that is, is everything uh, I want to talk about in terms of the epithelium neoplasms, the tumors derived from the adnexal structure. If you have uh, further questions, please feel free to reach out to me uh, either by the email or the text message. And um, uh, I will start to prepare my next lecture. If you can give me any advice or suggestions, please feel free. And for questions, I can answer them as well, either by email or uh, talk about them during the next presentation. And I hope you will have a great day and the best of luck in 2024. Thank you so much.